Union, a podcast about the joy we get from American politics, or as we like to call it, real debate without the hate. Hi, I'm Emily Brewer, and I'm a moderate Republican from Virginia. Hi, I'm DJ McGuire. I'm an inebriated libertarian, also from Virginia. Hi, I'm Greg Matuzak. I'll be your liberal Democrat from Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm Cliff Dunn. I'm a Republican from Virginia as well. I'm Kevin Kelton. I live in Los Angeles, and I consider myself a moderate Democrat. And as always, you guys can find us online at moreperfectunionpodcast.com. And we're actually up to 8,000 downloads per week, so make sure you find us on iTunes, or now we can be found on iHeartRadio. Um, and as always, blogs and commentary is available at moreperfectunionpodcast.com. And if you really, really love us and would make our hearts happy, please share us on Facebook as well. So, guys, it's been a pretty exciting week. We've had oh, the I, Olympics going this week. Oh, yeah. This is a great week. It's the one week where I consider myself a true sports fan. <laughs> I go, I love sports. <laughs> this is wonderful. And traditionally, this has been a very, very slow political week. Um, that, you know, every, every four years we do this and they go, oh, thank goodness for the Olympics. We don't have to talk about politics. But right now... Have you guys been seeing any Olympic politics stuff going on since that's what we well, do here? you know, obviously the Olympics are always political, but in an election year, I think it's highlighted even more. Nothing in terms of the United States versus the world. Obviously, it was very interesting in that judo match where uh, the Egyptian refused to uh, shake hands with the Israeli, which, which kind of surprised me because I thought that, I guess I'm naive, I actually thought that, that Egypt had kind of gotten beyond that, and apparently that that uh, that prejudice. Is Egypt, still the country, and Egypt's people are two different things. Yes, right. Very true. Yeah, but we saw earlier in the week the uh, there's that famous picture that hit Facebook of the uh, North Korean and the South Korean swimmers with that very famous selfie. That's what the kids are calling it, um, and that was really everyone loved it. Was that you know? was that uh, controversial in uh, North Korea? Was that a big problem? Yeah. I will tell you, unless that North Korean swimmer defects, when the Olympics are over, you will never see her again. Wow. So we should totally get her name and follow that. Just, you know, I'm interested now that you said that. The, the best way to describe the way North Korea is from a Washington Post story from, dear God, it's about 15 years ago, I am so old, about an apparent mistranslation that North Korea had in its communications with the United States. And the, and the author of the story actually wrote, no one is really sure of the fate of the translation, comma, to say nothing of the translator. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. Well, so, you know, I've been pretty proud of our Americans. Obviously, we had a huge feat this week. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's a little off topic from politics, but um, we were the first country ever to reach a thousand medals um, wow. individual in games, I didn't know which that. I think is, yeah, it's really cool. Um, so we're like, you know, a super country or something. Um <laughs> I saw I saw a joke on, on Facebook um, yesterday, and it said, "If you're stranded on a deserted island, what would you take?" And somebody said, "Michael Phelps, a saddle, and a stick with a gold medal in front of him." <laughs> so, and you'd be home anyway. in an hour. <laughs> right, exactly. But uh, and on another note, there's been something really historic that happened. Um, Simone Manuel, who's a swimmer for the United States, um, young black lady, beautiful, incredible swimmer, gold medal winner. And it's so historic because a black female has never won um, a gold medal in swimming, which was really, really cool. But if you think back to the times of Dorothy Dandridge in Vegas, I think it was in the mid-50s, they literally drained an Olympic-sized swimming pool because she dipped her toe in it. I did not know that. Yes. Wow. And so the historic proportion of a black female being able to compete at that level and succeed it was just so historic if you look back in time and you know just put that through that lens so i just thought that was a really really cool story what's so next? how far we've come as americans right what's next a black president <laughs> <laughs> now now we're either gonna get a really old white guy or a really old white chick yeah yeah <laughs> but old is the key well. which by the way i'm in favor of the old part yeah go old people yeah <laughs> Okay, so right, what else is what else is in the news yeah. this week? While, while, while all that was going on, there was actually quite an achievement in Syria, of all places. 
Last fall, when we when the administration first revealed that it was going to attempt to arm and train Syrian rebels who were neither tied to Assad, the Al Qaeda uh, branch, or Daesh, ISIS, however you want to call them, um, and then put them into the field, there was a lot of snickering, a lot of laughter, all the jokes about how things went wrong, arms drops in the wrong place, trainees that defected to, to al-Nusra, which is the al-Qaeda branch, and everybody had a big laugh and just shook their heads about what a disaster Syria was. Well, as it happened, one of those groups called the Syrian, is called the Syrian Democratic Forces, the Syrian Democratic Council, actually liberated a very big city in northern Syria, the city of Manjib, from Daesh this week essentially busted up Daesh's, and that's the term that the French use for ISIS, by the way, and I borrow it. They busted up Daesh's um, transport corridor for material and troops and things of that nature. Manjib was a big part of that, and that is now out of Daesh's hands. Uh, the U.S. provided air cover and air power, um, and we are still work. We are continuing to work with them to essentially. Um, the plan is to kick Daesh out of northern Syria. It was a rare success for a policy that, Frank, that all of us have criticized. I've done it too, but we have to give the administration credit here for, for if anything else, stubbornness and ensuring that no, we are not going to simply decide. Okay, in order to in order to back in order to defeat Daesh, we have to back the hideous Assad regime. They have refused to do that. Their policy is finally bearing fruit, and I think they deserve some credit for that. It was a good day for the good guys. Well stated. And of course, it, uh, you know, bringing it back to the election and politics, uh, it's it's Donald Trump who said that we can't do both at the same time; that we have to do one or the other, and that we should uh, just forget about you know uh, removing you know Assad and his regime because the more important thing is to fight Daesh. But you're saying that both can be done simultaneously, or at least we don't have to. We don't have to um, contradict our morals as a country in terms of where we stand on the Assad regime to be successful against uh, uh, Daesh in Syria, in Syria, right? That's that's exactly that's have... exactly right. That's exactly uh, what I'm Cliff, saying. Cliff, what yeah. do you think about this? I mean, is this is this like here's one for the Gipper? No offense. Um, or, or did or is this just like you know I the mean, blind squirrel get gets lucky every so often? <laughs> I'm leaning towards the blind squirrel. I mean, let, let's be honest. You've got, you've got the Kurdish fighter fighter groups, which are you know which have been you know training for a long time. Remember, the Kurds don't exactly uh, fall in one country in that part of the world. But the other thing is, I don't think that fight, putting all the all of our eggs in this third force basket, the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, has done as much good as we think. Because let's face it, this war has been going on for you know how long? It took them over two months to free a single city. I understand it doesn't happen overnight, but... We, it's it's one of these things where they say it's a pity they can't both lose. This is an example of how, yes, they can both lose, and we should do what we can to make sure they both lose. We cannot make the well, mistake that we keep making, which is saying, okay, the second worst guys are better than the worst guys, so let's do that. Because when the second worst guys win, they end up becoming the worst guys, and they forget everything we did for them and turn on us. I mean, you've got plenty of bad actors on all sides, and there is, I would say, hardly anything resembling a guarantee that if the quote-unquote democratic forces win, it won't be a quote-unquote democratic republic in the ex-communist sense. And speaking of uh, the worst uh, sides, uh, let's talk about the American political election, because clearly we have two sides. <laughs> <laughs> Your that, segues are great today, by the way. That awesome. Are, that uh, in a popularity <laughs> contest would be right behind Bill Cosby. <laughs> so every week we say Donald Trump had his worst week yet, and every week he keeps topping himself. Uh, this week he had, I think in five days, he had about six or seven slips. Let, let's talk about my favorite slip. is, uh, And this is the one I think was the most controversial. His second amendment one where he's like, hey, you know, once Hillary gets elected, and I'm going to paraphrase, and we can look up the actual quote, once Hillary gets elected and she starts getting those judges and they start taking away your rights, there's only, uh, there's nothing we can do except for you, the Second Amendment people. Hey, but I don't know about that. You know what I think he meant by that, and, and you know, I'm not one to defend Donald Trump in yeah. any stretch of <laughs> well, the imagination. We'll be the, we'll be the determiners of that, but go ahead. Of, of course you will, but... <laughs> 
But I, he, obviously, we know Donald Trump is, is not the well-polished linguist, if we will. <laughs> sure. So um, no, it, no. it is my guess. Not that cut that, by any stretch of the imagination. I don't know. He has a lot of good words. Yeah, yes. big words, huge, yes. incredible ones. Um, They're the best words. <laughs> the best words possible. But what I think he was trying to say here, and I can't believe I'm even defending Donald Trump. Dear God, let me drink. <laughs> but I think he meant the NRA. When he said the Second Amendment people, I think he meant the NRA. You know, I'd agree with you there, except the fact that he said once she was elected. And it, it was it was once she's elected and she's putting people in. So it's not like the NRA is going to put this letter writing campaign together or the NRA is going to, you know, somehow, you know, do a recall election. And it's well, not the like- NRA does a pretty good job of bottling up any legislation they don't like. Look at uh, how successful, quote unquote, the attempt to pass anything after Newtown was in the face of NRA opposition. I agree. But as far as putting judges in and as far as, uh, you know, stuff like that, I don't think the NRA can stop her nominating judges. Well, well sure. Okay. But well, as- let, to, to, to step back and look at this, because obviously we're never going to agree uh, right. You know, some people will say we're misinterpreting him. Some people will say he clearly was, you know, suggesting something nefarious. Um, the, I think the bigger point is, look, if you're running for president of the United States, you can't make slip ups like that. Now, Get everyone, right. everyone makes a slip up. Barack Obama made slip ups. God knows George Bush did. Uh, they're, they're, all, they're human. Ronald Reagan, John Kennedy, none of them are perfect. OK, but this man does it with impunity. He does it on, if not an everyday event, it's an every other day event. And many of them that could be could be explained away, he actually goes back and doubles down on. Oh, so, boy. Uh, which brings us to the, you know, the Obama founding ISIS thing. That wasn't Here. a slip up. He was trying to change the narrative. He was trying to set the media's hair on fire. He was being intentionally provocative. Yes. And he took a point, point that you can you can take you know loosely philosophically that the bumbling around in Iraq and Syria is responsible for this, and he threw the most provocative light on it but, that he but, could come but up he, with. But Cliff, there's no doubt about Cliff, that in my mind. He he was offered that explanation by Hugh Hewitt on the radio, and Trump yes, specifically sir. rejected it. No, and. and I'm not going to apologize for him doubling down on that point. Right. No, I'm just saying that, that, you know, my greater point is it's just for me, who was never going to vote for him in the first place, it's another example of why he's literally unqualified to be president. Now, I know a lot of people will say uh, there's only two qualifications for being president. You need to be 35 years old and you need to be a naturalized citizen of the United States and be here 14 years. Natural born, not naturalized. Big difference. Okay. thank you. That's correct. That's correct. But when, once you get beyond that and you get into the character traits, the human traits of a president, the, the man just seems day after day to prove himself not ready to go from private citizen to the highest political office in the world. You know, right. I remember I remember reading uh, in Time magazine, this is about a quarter of a century ago, right before the 1990 midterm elections. And they said if the, the author said, if you didn't know any better, you'd think George, Her- you'd think George Herbert Walker Bush was a spy for the Democrats. <laughs> if you look at what Donald Trump has done, Donald Trump has essentially delegitimized with his own words supply side economics, immigration restrictionism, both sides of the interventionist argument in foreign policy, and he has now delegitimized gun rights supporters by basically taking rhetoric. He doesn't speak the language of conservatives. He speaks the language that liberals think conservatives say. <laughs> There's a very big difference. And so what he has done is he has essentially allowed everyone left center and left of center to reinforce their own biases against us because, well, Donald Trump said it. He has essentially delegitimized every single conservative position one by one it's like he's checking them off on a list and we still have three months of this left and he's also trying to delegitimize the media that's his newest thing is he went from crooked uh, hillary to the crooked media that's been part of his rhetoric basically since day one yes though. yes i was just going to say that i saw this early on and 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 again there's a method to the madness 
He believes that if he can delegitimize the media in the eyes of his supporters and hopefully some people on the fence, that anything he does that, that the media calls him on, they will discount it because it's coming from the media. And I can tell you why that is not going to work, because every Republican nominee has tried to do that for the last 30 years, and all of them prior to Trump have actually had legitimate reasons for criticizing <laughs> media coverage of their campaigns. <laughs> he doesn't. Does the uh, sheer amount and you know sustained fire at the media that he's offering, does that have an impact, do you think, DJ? I don't think it will, because Trump's Trump's problem, and it's always been, the, and to, to be fair, he actually recognizes this is the problem that the people around him have. Trump's problem is that he can't get the center-right behind him. There is a chunk of the center-right that refuses to have anything to do with him. And this sort of critique is an attempt to get those of us who are not on board to get us on board, but it's not going to work. Well, let me. so let's take a look at this, and I hope I'm not being redundant here, but, but DJ right. laid out why he thinks that these are basically just strategic blunders. Um, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt, just for the purposes of this conversation. Maybe I like he doing actually, that. Maybe he actually has really good polling data that we don't know about, or he has an instinct about voters that is, you know, he, he might be the Michael Jordan of figuring out how <laughs> voters think. And, uh, he's got the unskewed data. You know, the, the fact that he won the Republican nomination shows that he's not a complete rube as far as this goes. Right, right. I, I will say over the last few weeks, I think it is it, it, there are elements of column A and column B. On the one hand, you know, if, if you look at the attacks on the media, they go back to a narrative that he's been building for over a year now. You know, he's he's made a decision on the somewhat oh, well, over the top attacks on Obama, i.e. The, he literally founded ISIS. But, but he has done this as a as what does seem to be on some level a conscious tactical decision. Definitely. You know, yeah. So what is that now, what is that tactic? For instance, I have a theory on the Obama one. Everybody knows that Hillary got a giant bump out of the DNC. That's obvious. He might have some polling or his instinct might be that a big part of that was Obama's speech. Uh, his testimonial for her on the Wednesday night prior to her acceptance speech. And he knows that Obama, come September, is going to hit the campaign trail with a 53-55 approval rating. So my guess is, he said, I got to take down his approval now before he goes out and starts doing that once a week in the fall. That's my theory. I think Kevin's actually on to something. But, yes, you know, I, I, I think he treats everything uh, from the lens of reality TV. And he looks at politics instead of poll ratings. He almost treats it like TV ratings. Right. And I think that's how he's applied um, kind of his marketing schematic to the campaign. Yeah, I'll say, say the only downside is, and I, I mentioned this two weeks ago, he has made a very clear decision that he would rather be on the top of the headlines every day if he can, That you know, even if it's bad news. And unfortunately, that's led to him, I will say, accidentally giving Hillary some cover, if you will, from the slings and arrows of things like the father of the Orlando shooter being at that rally. Right. Now, both candidates did make big uh, economic, you know, major policy speeches this week. Did you guys watch either or both, and what were your takeaways? Trump's basic tack backwards on his economic plan shows that he really didn't understand what his first plan was, which he put out back in February or, or whenever it was. He was attempting to put together a, uh, and this is the one thing that the one thing that he's hung on from the 1980s, from the actual Reagan administration, was the notion of um, the notion of, uh, of supply-side economic reform. Uh, he got it wrong in February, and he got it even more wrong this time because he focused it on certain tax, on certain certain income tax rates, and he didn't focus it on anything else. And he did it again this time. He's now making essentially the tax cut not as big as it was before. Uh, he's not looking, he didn't really spend a whole lot of time looking at deductions. In fact, he created another deduction specifically for child care that actually makes it harder for some of his own voters who are stay-at-home parents. Right. So right. He, 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 as the Russians would say, his friends the Russians, he basically stepped <laughs> on his own break again. Just to agree with you, DJ, it's interesting that for a party that always says we need to simplify the tax code, they never hesitate to add new deductions and try new social experiments with, the ta with tax breaks. That's a bipartisan thing. Both it parties... Is. 
you know, both parties might want, quote unquote, want to simplify things, but then they always find ways to recomplicate them even quicker than they simplify them. Right. Oh, no. Democrats never say that. We, we, are, <laughs> we are happy with making things like really complicated because it means more people work for the government. We are completely happy with that. So you, that's you'll a, never that's hear a, a Democrat a, say, and this bill is going to be so short, you can have it on a postcard. That will yeah, never come out of a Democrat's mouth. You'll yeah. never hear. You, usually it's like, okay, people, we're going to be no, here a while. This bill will be so long that you'll have to vote on it to figure out what's in it. Right. Exactly. Oh, yes, you'll hear yes. that quite a bit. Yeah. That's like our bag. <laughs> Um, I will I will say that it was interesting that uh, um, much like binders of women uh, this week, uh, Trump <laughs> added Trump added eight women to his economic advisors for this one. I don't know, did everyone read about that? I heard about it. They, I I heard about did anyone it. look at, if if they were all um, they were all high donors in his group? So they weren't like, oh, I'm going to go and seek out these people for their their knowledge. But they were mostly high donors. So, like, if you give enough money to the Trump, you get to be an right. economic. Well, well, they must advisor. have they must have pretty uh, impressive business backgrounds. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming they were hedge fund. Yes, they were hedge fund hedge fund people, and you know they worked somewhere across the country. Um, most of them, you know, I bet like they're that. all hot too. They're all. <laughs> They're, they're, trust me, there were no fatties, according to Trump, as he would say. Putting all that aside, it is a, it is just another reminder of, and, and Trump is not alone in this, the confusion that people have that assume, where people assume that business acumen is the same as, uh, as economic knowledge. They're not the same thing. Exactly. We should have learned in two that we should have learned in two thousand eight that finance and economics are not the same thing. We didn't. And now there are people who are confused and they think that business acumen means economic knowledge. It doesn't. But, uh, but essentially that's – again, it's just another it's, – it's another example of Trump's ignorance on this sort of thing. And I've, I've beaten up Trump for so long that I'm just – tonight that I'm just going to stop and drink a little more. <laughs> I, I will say that uh, since we're talking about the economic plans, I, I do think that in some respects Hillary Clinton's uh, manufacturing plans border on science fiction insofar as she's talking about – Need, needing to move, you know, move into these, you know, wonderful new industries, and let's face it, most of the people who lost their jo- who have lost their jobs to outsourcing to China aren't exactly, shall we say, of the demographic that you, you would target a new super tech savvy job to. And that's and it's it's just 21st century industrial policy. It's ooh, these seem, these seem nice. Let's pick them as the winners. They never work. They always lead to maladjust to malinvestments. They get things wrong. Um, they end up basically putting money through the wood chipper. Um, it's it honestly, it's the it's the latest version of shovel ready jobs. Um, and <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it and it and it and it deserves it deserves the same kind of attention and credibility, which is namely none. Well, that that brings us back to uh, a very good point, which is they they're both pushing infra- infrastructure programs of different sorts. Hillary's, I think, is a little bit more. Uh, robust, if I'm not mistaken. What do you guys think? Is is that a way to boost the economy? I mean, obviously, we, we have a crumbling infrastructure. No one denies that. I, I think whether or not it's a way to boost the economy, it's necessary. I mean, even if there were, quote, unquote, no direct economic benefit to fixing our infrastructure, we need to do it because, you know, we have how many hundreds or thousands of bridges and so forth that are basically falling apart because, they're at the end of their design life. You built stuff in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Right. Yeah, you've gotten 60 to 100 years out of it, but you know it's not going to last forever. It's like the tunnels going into New York City. They've um, they they're 100 years old. You got to replace them sooner or later, especially after a good salt bath, courtesy of Hurricane Sandy. Why don't we get back to the things that we do best here, which is making fun of uh, the presidential campaigns, the Clinton Foundation this week, uh, in a little bit more hot water over. Um, some emails that seem to suggest that Cheryl Mills, who is the senior advisor to Hillary Clinton, um, was in some way, although I disagree with it, but the implication is that there was a pay-for-play or a pay-to-play involved where people made big donations to the Clinton Foundation and then they were given, the, the meetings were facilitated, they were given access to ambassadors or something. 
Personally, I think it's a tempest in a teapot, but I understand that people who um, don't uh, particularly like the Clintons see it otherwise. Anybody here fall into that camp? It's the tempest in the teapot dome. Uh, hi. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 on the one hand, I think that they were probably reasonably careful in not specifically selling it to their donors as pay to play, which would be blatantly illegal. On the other hand, I think it's pretty clear that at the very least, Hillary Clinton was more than willing to have people at the State Department readily take calls from people from her fa- from the foundation, and thus there was an in, shall we say an indirect access hatch. Okay, so let's say that Go that's ahead. true, and and I, I, I'm not going to stipulate that it's true, but let's say for argument's sake that that's correct. How is that different than than lobbyists lobbying congressmen and uh, and paying for junkets, paying for plane rides, uh, you know? weekend golf outings for people who are then either writing and or voting on legislation that affects their business. How is it or, different? Or, or even go one differences. step further. The let, first let me, difference let me, is... Let me, add, let me add to that one, though. Or let's take a group like the Heritage Foundation, which everyone knows about, okay? And I bet every day people who give to the Heritage Foundation, same thing, they call everybody and say hey we got a guy who wants a job here we want a job here right is that different than the clinton because Uh, she's clinton and it wasn't for jobs by the way this was to set up meetings this was not to place people yeah uh, the the two differences the first is that with a lot of these lobbying firms and so forth there are actually disclosure rules etc in place this clearly skirts around that you know in a way that's even broader than the quote-unquote generic citizens united skirt arounds the other thing is the Clintons, shall we say, have a long and storied history of picking up money from questionable sources that should not be able no, to. We, we shall not you know, say get this that sort of because it's we not shall true. We not say that. I, I no. am not one of these people that will let something like that hang out there. There's Buddhist no temple. evidence of that. Whoa, 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 whoa! Oh, wait, are you really telling me <laughs> yes. that you have forgotten about the Indonesian regime whose friends put money into the Clinton administration? Have you forgotten yes. about the fellow who <laughs> threw? All uh, who's uh, the, the Riyadh family who threw all that money at the Clinton administration to essentially knock down the Utah clean coal industry by declaring the in, practically the entire state a national monument. Are you telling me you forgot about the various sources from the People's Republic of China who mysteriously managed to get money into Bill Clinton's reelection campaign? Because I haven't forgotten all those. Cliff hasn't forgotten all those. Emily may be too young for that, but we have not forgotten those. We have remembered. As for the foundation, I'm reminded of that phrase that Norm Leahy, who's a blogger here in Virginia, used. He got it from somebody else. If you can't drink their booze, take their gifts, eat their dinners, and then vote against them, you have no business being here. Um, So You've said that before, but I always enjoy it. I have said that before. And it still holds. Yeah. The more important thing regarding the Clinton Foundation is that it has actually caught the eye of, of uh, Preet Bara, who is the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. That's not an urgent situation because uh, Preet Bara takes his time in his investigations. He makes sure he actually gets his man or woman, as it would be. But he has already taken down the Speaker of the Assembly in New York. He's taken down the State Senate Majority Leader in New York, both of different parties, by the way. He's investigating uh, friends of the governor of New York. He's essentially on a one-man mission to clean up the state of New York, and that now includes the Clinton Foundation because she was a, she was senator from New York for eight years. I don't think that will have much of an impact this time because I think that investigation is really has just started. But it is a reminder, and it's just one of these things, and I'm just going to take us on a different path here, of why the vice presidential nom- nominees are so important. Given that Mrs. Clinton is as old as she is and that Mr. Trump is as old as he is, the vice presidential nominees should have more importance this year than they have in the past. And the fact that you have Mike Pence, who has essentially been a weather vane during the time he's been as governor, he's been a horrible disappointment. And as as a VP running mate, but go ahead. Right. As opposed to Tim Kaine. And I have lots of disagreements with Tim Kaine. Many, many disagreements, particularly on economic issues. Oh, yeah. I think he owes you five bucks, doesn't he? (laughs) But he... If Mrs. Clinton were to leave office for any reason, most Americans would say, oh, well, okay, Tim Kaine is president. The country is in good hands. I don't know if many people would say the same thing about Mike Pence. Tim Kaine looks like a better politician to most Americans than Mike Pence does. And ironically, what that means is 
as the two top candidates start keep throwing mud at each other, even if stuff sticks to Clinton at this point, people can say, if any of this stuff is actually true and she has to pull a Nixon and resign, and I'm not saying she would have to do that, we've got Tim Kaine. That's okay. Tim Kaine looks better than Mike Pence. So even this sort of thing eventually helps her in the end. Right. Because as Clinton and Trump drag each other down, Kaine still looks better than Pence. Right. And with the with the few remaining minutes we have, do we is there anything that happened in the other two campaigns this week? Let's not forget that we have two other people running for president, Gary Johnson for the Libertarians and Jill Stein for the Green Party. Did was there any change in, in their status? It was a fairly quiet week because because I'm the Johnson guy here. It was a fairly quiet week for Johnson. <laughs> oh, yeah, grow up, Greg. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. Never it's all good. Old. It never gets old. Um, but um, there was, I think, one. There was a poll here in Virginia that had him at twelve percent. So he is still in the in the high single digits or the or the lower or the lower double digits. Uh, there are a couple of polls out there that actually showed him ahead of Trump among voters under thirty five. So it's it's he is he is quietly he is quietly building support. Meanwhile, Jill Stein is out there. If somebody we talked about Manjib. Uh, she so thoroughly got that wrong that she actually said she was sorry to the people of Manjeev that the U- that the U.S. military campaign was hurting so many of them. Apparently, having no idea that the people of Manjeev are thrilled and are actually burning burkas because <laughs> Daesh is now out of the city. <laughs> so nicely done, Jill Stein. Uh, yeah. yeah, real clear politics. DJ, I have right a question has... for you: Does Johnson oh. get to fifteen percent? Does he get to fifteen? Yeah, by the, um, by the get into the debates. You know, I I'm not sure. Um, we've got we probably have about another month for that to happen. Um, right. To be honest, I I would I would actually say because he has harped on it so much, it makes it less likely because people will start. I think if he keeps pushing the 15 percent angle, people will start to see him more as a vanity act than as a serious candidate. I think what he needs to do and what he needs to do is. Talk more about the issues. Talk more about what he would do as president. Yes, he. It, it is very unlikely that he will actually win, but people will take you more seriously if you take the campaign more seriously. And I fear that if he talks about getting into the debates, getting into the debates, getting into the debates all the time, people will think that it, this is just about him hearing his own voice and not actually trying to help the country. So, based on this can on on where his campaign is going and what it's doing, I would probably say. No, he probably won't reach the 15% line in time for the debates. And just to build on that in, in terms of actual raw numbers, he has to do it in five different national polls, not just in one poll once. So, you know, that sets up much higher bar. Emily, what were you going to say? Um, so I have a couple things to add for this week because I've been watching the Johnson very closely. Um, <laughs> and I will say this, and I don't know if DJ has anything to do with this, but I suspect him. In Virginia, um, actually, the current polling they just did this past Friday, they've got Clinton at 43, Trump at 31, and Johnson at 12. So yep. I think DJ has put something in the water and that's what's happening there. And then he's popping 15. Johnson's popping 15 in Colorado. So I guess it's that, you know, all that pro-marijuana stuff, I would <laughs> yeah. imagine. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, 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 it's, it's marijuana and fireball, baby. But, <laughs> but on a more serious note, and you guys, you know, should definitely be watching this, especially Kevin and Greg, is um, I don't know if you guys have been watching Jill Stein that closely, nope. but all of her nope. platform within the past, like, 7 to 14 days – has basically taken on uh, the look of a Bernie Sanders campaign, and she's really hard courting his voters. And so um, if anyone's going to be worried about her, it should definitely be uh, Hillary. Yeah, she's still she's still pushing numbers like 2 and 3%. Um, and right now I'm, look, I'm looking at the national numbers right now, and NBC had Johnson, which I'm still giggling about, at 10, and ABC had him at 8, and that was uh, as of, like, last week. And then uh, Rasmussen had him at 8, Johnson at 8, which, you know, those numbers aren't moving up. And, in fact, in the past uh, two weeks, two weeks, uh, they're hovering around anywhere from 7 to 10, while the Clinton numbers are going up slightly, not much, but a little bit. 
So, no, I don't see Johnson making any large strides a lot for what um, DJ was saying. But Stein, no, she's hit her peak. She's hit her peak at two, three. She's done. She's she's hit her base. And, oh, you yeah, know, no, she's like, at her high point. The question oh, is, does she's, she's she at her high point. This, or does she stop? That's, this is yeah. Yeah, this is and, the best she's ever felt. Yeah, and 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 I'm not and I'm not going to take this opportunity to essentially blast all of the green parties around the world, because they have all made the same mistake. They have all portrayed themselves as a hard left wing party, which has essentially alienated most people to their right and ensured that they have nowhere to build on. The simple fact of the matter is, if you really want if you really want your party to build up, reach out to some folks who are right of center. Listen to them and try to win them over, because otherwise you will put yourselves in a, in a marginalized position where the Democrats will not have to listen to you. And this is another example this year. What a good show this week, guys. Um, just a quick reminder to our um, listeners, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes. Uh, make sure you like us on Facebook if you already don't, facebook.com slash Podcast And don't forget to please share us on your link on Facebook. And with that, we'll say good night, and we'll see you next week. Go Team USA.